chapter 8 today. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8 today. A couple of verses I want us to think about this morning. But in Nehemiah chapter 8, we shall start there today. Again, I am so glad, really, <clears throat> to see all of you here today. And I, I know I say this all the time. And you probably think, well, the preacher says that because he got to say it. No, not really. I didn't have to say that. I'm glad to see you. I really mean that I am glad to see you today and that you came out today uh, and that you're here. Your smiling face makes the place that much better. And I, I've said this before many times. Of course, over 40 years, I say a lot of things. But you know what? Uh, I appreciate everybody that comes. I appreciate the ladies that come because if this church was all men, it'd be an ugly place. I got to tell you that. But uh, so I'm glad for everybody today. Uh, that's here. So we're in Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah 8. <clears throat> so you have it. Let's stand, shall we? One more time. Because we're going to read part of that. It's not really what the message is about, but we shall read uh, <clears throat> this beginning in verse 7. We're going to skip the names until we get down. It says, And the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is that guy and Ezra, the priest, the scribe and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat. That's what makes a steak good anyway. Uh, eat the fat and drink the sweet tea and send portions unto them whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for another day. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to get to do what I, I love doing. Lord, I, and I pray you'll help me again today to, Lord, give some sense to the meaning of the words of the Lord that we have read today. Help us, we pray. Lord, we live in a very, very, very sad world. Lord, many, many heartaches, many sorrows in this life. Lord, it's true of the lost, it's even true in and save people's lives that things happen that we don't understand. Lord, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And that life is worth the living because you live. Lord, bless, we pray. Again, we pray for, there are multitudes of people that we know that stand in the need of prayer today. And Lord, for these, we lift up to you. We think of our good brother and sister Agnes and Dave. Lord, that watches. Father, we lift them up to you today. Uh, she told, Lord, you, you know. Lord, she has a hard time getting around now. And so, Lord, we pray for, pray for them. Pray for others who could not be here, Lord. They, they just simply could. We pray for those who, Lord, it's not only true of our church, it's true of many, many churches. I talk to preachers all, all over that there are many people who are, start, are still fearful, Lord. And even in our church, people who have not returned. And Lord, you know we love them. And we pray for them. Oh God, we have not been saved unto a spirit of fear, but a power and of might and of a sound mind. Lord, we need to have a sound mind about things. We need to make sound decisions about things. But Lord, we have not been saved unto a spirit of fear. I pray again that you will keep us. Lord, that verse, the verse is from Psalm 91. 
Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. O oh God, we claim that verses today, those two verses today. Lord, we should not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Lord, thank you again that you are so good to us. Bless us, we pray. In these few minutes, Lord, help me to say what I need to say in a timely manner. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. And amen, you may be seated. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength. As you probably know, some of you know, I, I like reading poetry. Uh, some of it, uh, you might say, well, I never got anything out of poetry. There's always something more to what meets the eye when you read poetry. Uh, there's something that the, the writer is trying to tell you. This poem this morning that I'm going to read is, is somewhat different. And it has somewhat of a sobering ending to it. And when we think of the joy of the Lord today is our strength. When we think about the shadows one day shall pass away. We have to be reminded that there are a lot of people, many people live in heartache and sorrow. <clears throat> Dr. Howell said one time, behind every door is a heartache. We don't know what goes on behind doors, and this poem is somewhat like that. Whenever Richard Corey went to town, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was gen a gentleman from sole to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked. But still, he fluttered pulses when he said, good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. Say, preacher, when you read that point, it's like, the guy had everything, and people envied him and looked at him and said, wow, this guy has everything, and, and he's everything that we would like to be. Yet he went home, and he killed himself. Henry David Thoreau, who was a philosopher of the 19th century, said this, the mass of men live lives of quiet desperation. We don't know what goes on. I do not really know what goes on in your heart. Thomas Wolfe, who was an author of the 20th century, he lived from 1900 to 1938. He died at the age of 37. He wrote this. Listen to this. The whole conviction of my life now rests upon the belief that loneliness, far from being a rare and curious phenomenon, is the central and, and inevitable fact of human existence. People think that, man, everything goes good, everybody, everybody's life is great, everything goes great, but listen, people are lonely, people live lives of desperation, even people, and if you looked around our church and looked at people and said, wow, everything's going really great and every good, everything is good in their life, you don't know what's going on inside of their heart. This week, you may have noted in the, in the news, at the end of last week, a pastor's wife disappeared. She was going to see her sister 
in Birmingham, Alabama. She was a mother of three young children, and she was going to go see her sister in, in Birmingham. She left from Kansas, somewhere in Kansas. She left from there and was going to go see her sister in Birmingham. She had said to her husband, when I go to Birmingham, I'm going to the hospital to get some mental help. Pastor, wife, three young kids, everything to live for. They found her Friday. She had killed herself. I said, preacher, why would she do that? When my wife and I were in college, I think she remembers this. Our, uh, the kindergarten teacher on Sunday night in church uh, went forward when the invitation was given. Everybody saw her go forward. And, you know, everybody kind of looked, well, what's she going forward for? Why is she going forward? The kindergarten teacher. A bunch of little kids. She taught. They found her the next day. She had killed herself. So why, why do people do that, preacher? Because, because as Thoreau said, people live lives of quiet desperation that we know nothing about. A, a somewhat well-known, I had only heard of him, 30-year-old preacher of a mega church in California. His name was uh, Roger, I think his last name was Wilson. I think that was his last name. Jared Wilson, that was his name, I got it. He's the pastor of thousands of people. He was a young guy. I, I, I've seen his picture before. Killed himself. I said, preacher, why, why, would he, why would anybody do that? Because people live lives of quiet desperation. I read a Gallup poll, and whatever that may mean, he had interviewed 200 million people. 200 million people. Out of 200 million people, 85% of them hate their job. They despise their job. They got nothing out of their job. I've had jobs before where I hated to go home at night because I knew I had to go back to work the next day. I, I, I hated the job so badly. Mr. Cobb, our, our, our 11th grade ag teacher, quite a remarkable guy, said this, he said he had an uncle when he was a kid. Mr. Cobb has now passed away. But he said he had an uncle when he was a kid who worked at the post office. Now, this would make anybody crazy, but he worked at the post office. And Mr. Cobb said that his uncle was the most miserable man he ever knew in his life because he hated his job so badly. So why do people work at jobs? Mr. Cobb also told us this. That if you ever find a job you really love, you'll never have to go to work again. And I found that to be true. Uh, you said, do you like, uh, this? I love doing this. This is what I, I, I love doing this. The time for me passes by. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be short today, but I try every Sunday to be short and it never works out. I, I love this. But people have jobs they hate. He said, Preacher, I'm one of those people. I, I, I hate my job. Maybe, maybe you're not. Maybe you, you love your job. We live in a, in a society in America, I, I, I think it's probably Western civilization, which would include Europe, at least uh, uh, Western Europe, that uh, we, we've now reached the divorce rate in our, it's kind of stable, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of people wind up divorced. Of the 100 percent that's left, so somewhere between 60 and 50% of that percentage, we'll say the 100% of them, 40% of them are totally unhappy in their marriage. They, I read this statement by one man. He said he had been married for 20 years. He said, my wife and I became enemies pretty quick off. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And if we are not careful... If we're not careful, we, we, we become just like the world and we are unhappy and, and our life is, is miserable. I know that married people fight. At least I think they do. My wife and I have never had a fight. We, you know, 
It, we've never had a crossword. Our words flew so fast they didn't have time to cross, I'm telling you. But I know that people, people have disagreements. I know that. I'm, I'm aware of that. And, and in your life, you'll probably have disagreements. Look, friends have disagreements. You and your friend may have a disagreement about something. But a, a, a friend is someone who knows you for who you are and they still like you. They're still your friend. You may make a mistake, but they're still your friend. Husband and wives have disagreements from time to time. That happens. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm talking that people who are married, 40 to 50, 40 to 60 percent of them are of the 100 percent are just plain unhappy, and they, but they just stick together. For a lot of times, it's because of money. They can't afford to split up. They got to have money because they become accustomed to the life, but they're willing to be miserable in their life. Sometimes it's the kids. Sometimes it's pressure. Uh, well, I don't know what my parents would, would think about me if I got a divorce. And, and uh, that, there, there's all kinds of reasons that people stay together. Now, some people stay together because they're happy. Uh, let's put that down. Some people are happily married. Some people's lives, as I said about Thoreau said, that the mass of men live their lives in quiet desperation. Why that woman, why that preacher's wife kill herself? I read several articles of people that you wouldn't think would, why would they do that? There's never a good answer to, to, to suicide. I've always found that John said this to me one time, I remember this, that it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Uh, it's not that people don't get discouraged, because they do. But most people always see that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, that they're going to come out of it, and everything's going to be okay again. Nehemiah, Nehemiah said that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Why is it that people kill themselves? Why is it that people live marriages where they're totally unhappy in them, but they, they just stay together. Again, I know that people uh, have arguments. My brother said to me one time, he never went home till 11 o'clock at night on Sunday because he knew by then mom and dad would be in bed and they would quit arguing. For whatever reason, my mom and dad always seemed to get into it on Sunday after church. You'd think they would be happy after church, but... And they would be, they, they would argue. Uh, what do you want? Uh, I want fried eggs and bacon. Well, I want scrambled. And they would just, you know, the silly things. I know that stuff happens. And I know that they truly, deeply love one another. That, that wasn't, he always said, I figured I'd see him on the 11 o'clock news one night. But, uh, you know, they, they did. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about you had a bad day at work. I've had bad days at work before. Who hasn't? Something didn't go right. Uh, the cows didn't give any milk, or you hit, your, you hit the wrong nail with the hammer, or uh, the kids were acting up in school, or you had a bad day around the house where uh, my, my daughter-in-law said the other day, my kids need to go back to school. Yes. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. Uh, one of the things that I tell people, if somebody came to me and said that, hey, uh, uh, we're thinking about getting married, well, what do you got to tell us? Or if people come to me and say, well, I'm, I'm, we're having some problem. You need to expect in your life, every day, any number of problems. Now, I'm not talking end of the world problems. I'm not talking where the bottom falls out. I'm not talking you'd have to die uh, to feel better, uh, not that, not that. You, you, but you should expect there'll be problems. The lawnmower won't run, you get a flat tire, you burn the beef, you know, it, it, just any number of problems. But multitudes of people don't live that way. They, they are extremely unhappy with life. 
to the point where they never see life as ever getting any any better. You say, well, preacher, what what's what's wrong with, and with people? And and the truth is that that many Christians fall into the same category. They're just unhappy with life. It's like not, life has nothing to offer them. You say, well, why is that, preacher? What is it that causes that people to live like that, to live in unhappy marriages, to, to have a job that you hate so badly? You just, and in some cases, like these people go off their rocker and they go down and shoot everybody up. They hate the job and the, so badly. Why, why do people live like that, preacher? Why are they so unhappy? Let me just give you a couple things this morning. One is this, that people really have no purpose. People have no purpose in their, their life. Uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. He said, fear God, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What, what is my responsibility? Well, somebody asked Jesus, said, well, uh, Rabbi, Master, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul, and to love thy neighbor as thyself, for on this the whole law hangs. So what does that mean? Well, the first of the Ten Commandments, the first four, are our relationship to God, and the last six are our relationship to man. That's why we honor our mother and father. That's why we don't kill people. That's why we don't steal from people. That's why we don't commit adultery. That's why we don't covet things. That's why we don't lie about people. See, because we love our neighbor as ourselves, and then we love the Lord God. Not to use the Lord's name in vain. Remember the, and I, I, of all the Ten Commandments, Jesus did not repeat this one, but remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Thou shalt not make any graven image. Our, our responsibility toward God. Jesus said to love the Lord God. John said in 1 John chapter 2, he said, I'm not giving you a new commandment, but he said, this one commandment I write, that you have love one toward another. People without God. People without Christ. They, they, well, what's the purpose? I said several weeks ago, if you're a famous person, so-called famous person, some singer or... Now, most of you probably know, who was, the, who was that uh, black guy that wore the glove? I knew you guys. No, I knew it. I knew it was. But... All the money in the world. All the money in the world. And he kills himself. Well, he didn't mean to kill himself, preacher. That guy, uh, that was in the Patriot. He, he no, this, this kid, he's Ledger. They found him in his apartment dead. He overdosed on drugs. I said, preacher, why would anybody do that? Because once you get up here, there's no place to go but down there. As, as believers in Christ, the, the joy of the Lord, not, not my joy, but the joy of the Lord is my strength. Brother Curtis said that, and this has been 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 40 years ago. He said, and there is this town, when you go around Atlanta, or going around, either you're going down through Atlanta or around the Beltway or whatever it is, there's this town called Hapeville, H-A-P-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Well, the guy gets off the airplane and, he didn't know any better. He said to the taxi driver, can you take me to Happyville? And the driver just turned around and looked at him and said, S he said, sir, I wish I could. What is it about that, that life? And again, I, I, I caution you that on any day you can have a problem. But what is it that people find so difficult that they live their lives, that the, the majority of mankind lives their lives in and quiet desperation. How can I get out? How do I get out? Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher, guy was out in left field. 
when he died, some guy climbed up in a tree to see the funeral and fell on his coffin as it was going by. Nietzsche said, the only logical sane thing for a person to do is to kill themselves because the world is so messed up. And people say, well, you know, I don't have a reason for living. I have no reason for living. I don't have any joy in my life. And again, you know, happiness is, is based upon the circumstances, but the joy of the Lord is something different. Paul said to the, the churches when he wrote, uh, peace, hope, and joy. The fruit of the Spirit is, is love, peace, and joy. Or love, joy, and peace, one of the, one of the ways there. But, but that's what the fruit of the Spirit is. And, and as believers, and, and anybody, I don't care who it is, whether you're saved or lost, I pray to you don't understand my life. I don't need to understand your life. It's like I tell the kids on the bus. Everybody has problems. You know, they say, this kid looked at me. I mean, that's their big problem. That kid looked at me. Jim, that guy looked at me. Everybody has problems. Maybe yours will work out too. I, I don't know what people's problems. But he said, well, I, you don't understand my life. I just got a boatload of problems. Hey, can I encourage you to do this? Somebody told me to do this once. Go home and start writing all your problems down. You probably won't have more than five or six. Probably won't get to ten. But the reason that people, one of the reasons that people are so unhappy with life is they have no purpose. They have no reason. You need a reason to get up in the morning. I'm just going to sleep in bed till ten o'clock. You got to have a purpose. Bear Bryant, who coached Alabama for years, retired. And he was well, he's in his 70s when he retired. Somebody said to him, met him one day, well, what are you going to do now? He said, I guess I'll just die. And two weeks later, he died of a heart attack. You have to have a purpose in life. And the Bible tells us this, that Jesus is that purpose. He is the reason that we live. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. You say, well, preacher, you don't know about it. I might have to have a bad operation, or, or somebody I know has cancer, or somebody I know has heart problems, or I have money problems. Money problems are at least your problem. But people say, I have money problems. And I don't see any way out. You remember It's a Wonderful Life? Jimmy Stewart, Christmas movie. He said, I'd be better off dead. He had a life insurance policy. He said, I'd be better off dead. I'd be worth more dead than I'm alive. He said, well, I got money problems. I got all these money. Look, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to no understanding. In all, thy way, in, all thy ways, commit, in all thy ways, commit thy way unto him and he should direct thy path. It says right under that, that we're to give out the, the first fruit of our substance to God. People have no purpose. Look, your mom and dad are going to disappoint you. Your wife will disappoint you. Your husband will disappoint you. Your kids will disappoint you. Your brother will disappoint you. Your sister will disappoint you. Your friends will disappoint you. The preacher will disappoint you. The people in church will disappoint you. But Jesus never fails. Never. Other friends may prove untrue. Doubts and fears of sale. But there is one who cares for you. Jesus never fails. People have no purpose for their, their life. My purpose, my purpose for these last 40 plus years has been this. That is my purpose. That is my reason. That's, that's what I do. What, this is, do what, slow down, will you? This is why I do what I do. This is my purpose. It's given me a reason. Growing up in the 60s, a lot of you grew up in the 60s. It was a very turbulent time. And I was greatly affected by a lot of things that went on. I was greatly affected by my 10th grade English teacher.
And I looked at my bourgeois father, and I said to him, I don't want to live like you. You have no purpose. I didn't say it to him like that. I just told him, you have no purpose, Dad. You do the same exact thing every day. And I told him, I don't want to live like that. Now I live like that. But, you know, it's like I, I didn't want to live like that. I, didn't, I had no purpose. I had no direction. I had some goals in my life, but it, I did not have a centralized purpose. I had nothing that I could fall back to, no button I could fall upon. My father listened to me that night, and I was pretty upset when I told him that. I wasn't yelling or screaming, man. I was crying because I was so upset about life. My cousin Billy, Bill, my cousin Billy had a lot of problems. He had, he had a lot of problems, a lot of problems, but his biggest problem was his mother. And one day they went out and came back. And my cousin Billy had killed himself. No purpose, no reason. Why would a, why would a, a successful preacher of a mega church, 30 years old, kill himself? He lost somewhere his purpose. Why would that dear, dear lady? And we don't know all the problems. We don't know the problems. Again, we don't know what's going on in people's lives. But a mom of three kids, a young, a young mom, killed herself this week. It's a preacher, that's horrible. It is. It is. The church is in mourning. Her husband is mourning. The kids are in mourning. If you have ever contemplated that, let me, let me just say this. I think the highest form of the rejection of God is homosexuality. But I believe the highest form of selfishness is to take your life and to leave me here crying. And to leave everybody else crying. People have no purpose as to why they get up every day. Well, preacher, I love my job. That's what, Okay, there you go. But again, 85% of the people in the world, I know it was a worldwide survey, 85% of the people in the world, they don't like their job. People don't have a purpose. The second, second thing is they've, they've lost sight. They have lost sight of what is really important. Maybe they had a purpose in life. Maybe they said, man, I, 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 man I'm, I'm happy. But somewhere along the line, things began to kind of slide down the other way and they now they've lost the, the whole purpose they have forgotten the purpose of their life for example understand how I'm saying this if you married the person you married to make you happy that probably ain't gonna last I've said this that marriage is not 50-50. Now, you may divide the chores up, and since Carol is, and she's milking this knee thing for all it's worth, I'm telling you. Okay, so I basically, I become the man of the house. I do the dishes, I do the laundry, I do a lot of the cooking, and um, so, well, it should be that way, 50-50. Well, it's a hundred nothing right now, but that, 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 my dear friend, is the purpose. I did not marry my wife for her to make me happy. Now, she, she does. I, I love my wife, and, and we, we really do. We really do like each other most of the time. But if you got married so that the other person would make you happy, well, I got married because my wife was, is beautiful. That'll quick, that'll fade. Somebody said beauty is only skin deep, but ugly, run, ugly runs clear to the bone. I'm, I'm saying that, that I remember in school, Stanley Little, he would always say, hey, dreamboat. And some girl would turn around and say, not you, shipwreck. 
But it's like, you know, it's like, we just, if you got, if you, if, if you, if you're trying to find your happiness in someone else, that probably isn't going to work very long. But if you're trying to find your happiness in what you can do for somebody else, someone has rightly said that joy is defined as Jesus, others, and then you. Jesus, others, and you. What happens is, well, uh, with a friendship, with a church, with marriage, it, it, it does, or job. Man, you, 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 my, I better not say this. But we get, we look at it and say, boy, this is great, this is great. And then after a while, we begin to kind of wane on it. I've said, everybody goes through, everybody, it doesn't matter whether it's a church, whether it's a friendship, or whether it's a marriage, everybody goes through these four stages, these four stages. Romance. She's the most wonderful. He's the most wonderful. He's the best friend. He's, she's the best friend uh, that I've ever had in my life. I find no fault in him or her or my friend. Then reality sets in. First the romantic, then reality. Reality is when you wake up and realize they leave their clothes laying everywhere. Reality is that they're a slob. Reality is that they are a neat freak. Now, if you've ever been around a neat freak, everything's got to be just ship shape. My, my dear wife is kind of that way. She's vacuuming. I just lift my feet up and let her go to it. You know, I just, uh, good job. But reality is that they're not everything I thought they were. Well, my friend didn't exactly everything I thought that he would be. He wasn't there for me, which is what a friend does. And then comes regression. Regression is, well, I don't think I love them anymore. I don't think I want to be their friend anymore. I've heard the preachers joke so many times, I don't know that I want to go back to church there anymore. If you do not, if you do not get out of that, you'll wind up not having a friend. You'll wind up not going to church. You'll wind up divorced. Which brings me to the fourth thing, rekindled. Well, you know what? My friend is pretty good. My wife is the best. I've told her many times, it makes my head spin to think how fast you'll get married if I die tomorrow, but I've told her, I'll never get remarried. I'll never find anybody like you. Never. I'm playing the field next time, brother, but I, I'll never find anybody like her. It's just, if you don't get rekindled, and it's true of the Lord, Boy, when we first meet the Lord, oh, this is the greatest thing. Man, I'm so glad I'm saved. Man, I'm on my way to heaven. Man, this is great. My sins are forgiven. Jesus is my Savior. Everything is wonderful. But then reality sets in, and it's like, wow, it's not the bed of roses all the time. Sometimes it's thorns. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease? Well, no. The Christian life sometimes is a struggle. Brother Curtis had a guy get saved in his church, and the guy quit coming. And Brother Curtis went to see him. And Brother Curtis said, well, we sure have missed you. And the guy just looked at him and said, look, I was better off before I was saved. I was happier before I was saved than now that I am saved, because now the devil is attacking. Now the devil is after you. Now you're in battles. People lose their... Not a purpose, but they lose sight. And so then they say, well, uh, I'm not going to read my Bible anymore. They get to the regression stage. I'm not, gonna, I'm not getting anything out of my Bible reading. My prayer life, I, my prayers aren't getting any higher in the ceiling. Man, I go to church and hear the preacher, and nah, I just, I just, I'm, I'm not getting anything out of it. If you don't get to the rekindled part, I cannot tell you how many people that I personally know that at one time were hot for God 
they don't even darken the door of the church anymore. They not only, they, they had a purpose. See, a lot of people don't have a purpose. They had a purpose, but they lost sight of the fact that Paul says this in Colossians 3.1, set your affections on things that are above, not on things of the earth. We're looking there. That's where we're going. It's okay to have a nice car. It's okay to have a nice house. It's, nice, it's okay to have nice trinkets. It's okay to have nice clothes. It's okay to have nice stuff that you do. But that's not our goal. That's not where we're headed. That's not our purpose in looking. When you look around, oh, what was it, three Sundays ago, four Sundays ago, you probably wouldn't remember, but three or four Sundays ago, they had a race up here at the, the, the dirt track. And uh, that evening, I think we had a meal that day, that evening I sat out on my porch and I watched, really I lost count of how many campers. Some of them I believe were probably more expensive than the house I just bought. But those things fade. Those things will never bring lasting. It's not that they don't, you don't get some happiness out of them. But if that's what you're looking at, if you're trying to keep the meaning of life in the things that you see, it'll never work. Solomon wrote in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 17. <clears throat> I rarely have ever used Song of Solomon. It's a good book. But he said this, the first part of verse 17. Until the day breaks, and the shadows flee away. We live in a world of shadow heartache and heartbreak and if you don't have a purpose for life you'll become like those that Thoreau said people live in quiet desperation or like Thomas Wolfe said that loneliness is the inevitable ending loneliness far from being rare is what happens to people and I'm glad you're here today but how can I be lonely when I have Jesus only to be my companion and I'm failing God? People lose the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. Do I, do I get discouraged? People say, do you ever get discouraged, preacher? Yeah. Um, Thursday I was. Um, I can't tell you everything that happened. I don't remember anymore what happened. I just remember that I was really discouraged. She said, what's wrong? My standard reply, nothing. Now she knows there's something wrong. I'm not laughing, I'm not joking, I'm not being stupid like I normally am. I'm very somber and very, do you ever get discouraged? Yeah. Oh, I know what it was. It was Wednesday. It was Wednesday. It was Wednesday morning and I was really discouraged Wednesday. I can't, I can't even, if I told you why, you would say, preacher, you are an idiot. I know that. I'm well. And I said, Lord, please help my spirit. Revive my spirit, Lord. God has a funny sense of humor because I prayed, Lord, respect. Lord, restore my spirit. Bob Bosco shows up. You know, it's like, what am I? But, but he did. Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Not this world. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. Houses, cars, land, all that may temporarily satisfy. But only Jesus. We'll do that. People, either A, they have no purpose for living, or they've had a purpose, but they've lost it. Ezekiel says that be anointed with fresh oil. Sometimes that's just what we need. A little bit of fresh oil from God to get us going down the right path. The world is terribly unhappy. But the joy of the Lord 
That is my strength. That is your strength today. Father, we thank you. Lord, time's up. Here we go. Another Sunday. Lord, I thank you again. Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for that. I have no strength in and of myself. The journey is too great for me, Lord. The journey is too great. I need thy help. Lord, I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee, most blessed Savior. I come to thee. Lord, help us today. I don't know, maybe there's somebody here today. Maybe somebody watching today. Maybe, maybe somebody's here today. Maybe they're trying to find happiness in others. Maybe that is their source of their, Lord, that it'll, it'll fail. It, it will. Lord, we find happiness in doing for others. Lord, I've been to Happyville. Lord, it's a great place to be. The joy of the Lord is my strength. One day the shadows of this life will pass away and the day will break. The eternal day. And then we will understand that it will have been worth it all. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ today. I love them. God, I know that you love them more than I could ever possibly. And Father, I know that you want what's best for them in their life. Lord, help us to set our affections on things that are above, not on things of this earth. Lord, may our joy be found in thee, not in the things of this earth. This life will disappoint us many times. But Lord Jesus, you never will. You never show up late. You may not always be when we think you ought to be on time, but you're always never late. Lord, thank you that we serve such a wonderful Savior. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so. Help us to love you, Lord, because you first loved us. To love you and to love our neighbor. Lord, I guess if we really thought about it, a real prescription for getting out of it, just loving people, just loving them, not for what they can do for us, but just loving them for who they are. Father, I thank you again for the opportunity to be here, to be in this place, to be with these people one more time, one more time. Lord, bless us, we pray, and help us, we ask. Before we go, I'll just quickly, I, I, I think I know the answer to this, but maybe somebody watching, somebody's here. It's a preacher, I've never had a real purpose in my life, and I've never really met Jesus as my Savior. I have no reason for getting up every day. I have no reason for living every day. I have no joy in my life. I'm one of those people that live in mass desperation, this quiet why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Have hope in God. Somebody said, Preacher, I'm not sure I'd even go to heaven when I die. Would you pray for me today? I'm not sure about heaven. Preacher, I'd like you to pray for me. I think I know everybody here. But somebody said, Preacher, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. I've never believed on him. I've never relied upon him. I've never taken a bite of the bread of life, taken a drink of the water of life, gone through the door to find green pasture. I've never been born again. It's all the same thing. Preacher, would you pray for me today? Father, I don't see any hands today. Lord, I imagine that if I ask for people to raise their hand who are having problems with life, if people were honest, they, we would have some hands go up. Not everybody, but probably some. Lord, because they, in some ways, they've been dealt a hand that they really don't like, and it's been hard. But Father, I, I pray for all my brothers and sisters today that, Lord, you would meet the need of their hearts and lives. Help us to love you. Lord, when we truly love you, that will be our purpose with our friends, 
our church, our job, our husbands, our moms, our dads, our brothers, our sisters. Lord, help us to love you. Thank you again for this day. Lord, it's been a quick morning again. But Lord, I thank you for it. Bless, we pray, the rest of our afternoon, and bless our service tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.